Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening for the Board of Directors meeting for Wednesday, May 19th of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. It's 630 and we will call the meeting to order. I will turn it over to Melinda Stevens and we'll have a roll call. Um, but just before I do that, I'd like to introduce a new member who's not really a new member. Uh, Anita Seitz, mayor from Westminster, is now going to be the member from Westminster and formerly was the alternate. So welcome, Anita. And with that, we will have a roll call. All right. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And here we go. Okay. Aaron Brockett from Boulder. Present. Adam Cushing of Brighton. Adam Zarin of the Governor's Office. <clears throat> Allison Coombs of Aurora. Present. Anita Seitz of Westminster. Present. Bill Gipp of Erie. Connected. Bill Van Meter of RTD. Present. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. John Marriott of Arvada. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Here. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Here. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. David Adams of Mead. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Here. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. George Teal of Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Jacob LeBure of Lakewood. Dana Gutwine of Lakewood. Jim Dale of Golden. Here. James Kumerly of Lock Bowie. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Present. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. Joan Peck, Longmont. Here. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Lisa Jones of Foxfield. <clears throat> Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Joyce Downing of North Glen. Kara Tanucci of Central City. Jeremy Fay of Central City. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Jackie Thomas, Decono. Jolan Clark, Denver. Here. Christopher Larson of Nederland. Larry Vidum of Bennett. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Celeste Arner of Federal Heights. Here. Linda Olson of Inglewood. Here. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Margot Ramsden of Bomar. Michael Hillman of Idaho Springs. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Nicholas Angelo of Lyons. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Nicholas Williams of Denver. Here. Nicole Frank of Commerce City. Present. Pamela Grove of Littleton. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Sean Foray of Morrison. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Toucher of Glendale. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. Here. Rebecca White of CDOT. Here. Roy Palmer, Columbine Valley. Gail Christie, Columbine Valley. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. 
Tim Barnes of Lafayette. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. I'm here. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Here. Tammy Mauer of Centennial. Present. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. Here. Wynne Shaw of Lone Tree. Here. All right. And uh, just in case I did miss anyone during roll and they weren't able to unmute, uh, if you want to go ahead and raise a virtual hand now and let us know that you are present. So I'll just go ahead and call on folks. And um, if you're in the attendee panel, you can raise your hand as well if you're supposed to be the board member. And just remember, we only have one of the member or alternate sitting at the board table at the regular meetings, whereas at the study sessions, we have both members at the table. And if you've dialed in by phone and you're a board member, please raise your hand by dialing star nine. Uh, so first we have Bob Pfeiffer. Hi, Bob. And I saw in the list um, Adam Cushing and Tim Barnes, but I didn't hear them when you did the call. Is anyone else uh, unable to participate in the attendance section? And so we have Linda Montoya, uh, Tim Barnes, as I said, and Adam Cushing there represented. So thank you. We've marked you all here. Anyone else not able to participate in roll call? All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so that takes us through that, and we will move on to the next agenda item, which is setting our agenda. Could I please get a motion to approve the agenda this evening? I have a hand Go raised on. up. Great. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. That takes us to our strategic informational briefing section of the meeting tonight. Our first item is the Denver Foundation, a summary and overview. I'm going to turn it over to Brad Calvert, who's our director of uh, regional planning and development to introduce this item. Brad, could you tell us about it? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening, every, everyone. Um, really pleased to have a couple folks from the Denver Foundation tonight. Uh, this is a, a classic example of how COVID interrupted uh, all things in our life. We actually were planning to have the foundation present um, to the board in March of April of last year um, as part of their community input sessions uh, that informed uh, their new uh, strategic uh, framework. Uh, but here we are, uh, and we really do appreciate uh, the foundation sort of circling back uh, and to share uh, the, the framework with the board this evening. Uh, we were able to actually host them um, back in February uh, where all of our area agency on aging program managers sat down and had, had a conversation with the foundation as they were beginning their, uh, their thinking on their strategic uh, framework. So happy we were, we were at least able to uh, have that uh, happen. So again, really happy that uh, the foundation has returned uh, to brief uh, the board tonight on their new strategic uh, framework. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Desa West, uh, Chief Impact Officer, and uh, Javier Alberto Soto, uh, President and CEO uh, of the Denver Foundation to share tonight's presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank Hi, you, everyone. Madam. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm gonna start us off um, by sharing our screen and turning it over to our CEO, Javier. Thank you, Desa, and, and thanks to all of you for welcoming us this evening. Um, we're really excited to share a little bit about the Denver Foundation, um, and as Brad mentioned, to, to do a, a deeper dive in our, into our strategic framework that was adopted by the board last fall and that we've just launched in the last couple of months. Um, as Brad noted, all of which was made a little more complex thanks to, to COVID and quarantines and, and all of that and working remotely. Um, but we, we started this process in the fall of 2019. Um, I had just arrived at the Denver Foundation um, and we knew that we had a strategic plan that would lapse in 2021. So we got to work right away and we're really um, fortunate to have started when we did um, because although we were able to continue the momentum once, once the pandemic struck, um, you know, clearly it was, it was difficult to get as much community input as we had liked 
Um, so we, we switched gears and did as much as we could in, in the remote world. Um, but really what you'll see um, later on is a plan and a framework that is guided by um, community voice. And, and, and that's what our, the, the core of our mission is, is to follow community voice to create a, a greater community for all of us. So first, just to, to give some, some, some thoughts around the role of philanthropy in, in building community. You know, philanthropy has a deep history and tradition in America. Philanthropy has often been involved in building community solutions and, and seeking to solve society's toughest challenges. It's also a major economic engine, investing billions of dollars each year in communities across the country and employing thousands of people. Working together with government, philanthropy also often can help to lead in innovative ways, bring about catalytic transformation that, that at times is difficult for either philanthropy or government to do by itself. So the Denver Foundation is, is what's known as a community foundation. And I'll tell you a little bit about what, what a community foundation is. First, as you'll see, there are, I think at last count, over 700 community foundations across the United States. Um, they were born just over 100 years ago um, in the Northeast and the industrial Midwest. The Denver Foundation was created 96 years ago. So we're excited to be coming upon our 100th anniversary in 2025 and, and have big plans um, that we're putting together for that. So there's a, there's a deep tradition and history behind the community foundation movement in America. And so what, what is a community foundation? Well, you know, I describe it as being part a nonprofit, part a foundation and part a financial services firm. And so some of the characteristics um, that, that you'll, you'll find across the board in all community foundations are number one, they're local. They're, they're, community foundations have a local footprint, a local focus and, and area of, of particular passion. And for us at the Denver Foundation, that's the seven county metro area. That's from our, our founding documents, the, the area that, that our founders said, this is where we wanna invest to create a stronger, better community, community. So local is one aspect across the board that all community foundations share. They're independent. And I think that's, that's particularly important in this day and age where there aren't too many independent voices in the, in the political and, and public arena um, with really only one sole priority. And that's what's in the best interest of, of the community. So we'll talk later about, about working together with government, but you all share, local government officials in particular, share that, that groundedness of being in tune with what's best for a community and, and trying to separate any of the, the voices that perhaps have other interests or agendas in mind and just focus on what is best for that community from that independent lens. That's where the Community Foundation has always stood for and will continue to, to, to stand for. Community foundations are meant to be permanent. So we house endowment dollars um, that are here in perpetuity to help build that better community. Um, we have a broad mission in, in mind. We do have public charity status um, and a number of the, of the funds that we manage are in what's called donor advised funds where we partner with individual philanthropy, philanthropists to promote their passions and, and help to steward their legacies and invest in, in the things that they're most passionate about within the community. So in terms of the grant making that comes out of, of the Denver Foundation and, and other community foundations, number one is the discretionary dollar. So that endowment, which at the Denver Foundation we call the Fund for Denver that has been built up over 96 years now um, and allows us to invest in, in areas that, that we believe are most pressing and, and that frankly are always evolving as they should be. As the community evolves, their needs evolve and the grant making strategy should evolve as well. These other grant making tools that you see here are all in some way donor connected. And it's important to note that, that the majority, frankly, the vast majority of the dollars that are housed at the Denver Foundation, which are now over a billion dollars in assets are in one or several of these donor connected funds, be they donor advised funds, 
or field of interest funds where a donor may say, please invest in education broadly as a subject. Um, designated funds where a donor may say, please steward this money in perpetuity for the benefit of the Boys and Girls Clubs, as an example, or scholarship funds. And the Denver Foundation actually has a really robust um, scholarship portfolio, one of the largest in the country for community foundations. So now I want to turn the page to the strategic framework um, that Brad mentioned and that we've been hard at work at for, for a year and a half and, and really proud of. And to do that, I'm, I'm going to turn it back over to Desa West, who's our chief impact officer and who quarterbacked our entire strategic framework building process. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, so many of you that I haven't seen in a couple of years. So it's fun to be with you again tonight. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our strategic framework. And, um, you know, as we think about the purpose of our presentation tonight, I think it's important to know that we're really hoping uh, that you'll think of the Denver Foundation, that you'll think of the Denver Foundation as a possible partner. We hope you'll be listening for potential partnership opportunities, whether those are immediate or something that you think is longer term, and that you're thinking about who else needs to know about the Denver Foundation and its strategic framework, um, that it would make a difference um, in their work and their impact in the community. So our strategic framework process um, took us about 15 months. Um, we spent really deep time in community and deep time really thinking about what the community had to tell us. And one of the things that came out of that was that our board of trustees said, you know, equal access to opportunity, particularly when we look at communities of color and the disparate impact of many issues on those communities is really important to us. Um, and so you'll see that our vision statement has changed um, to a Metro Denver that is racially equitable in its leadership, prosperity, and culture. And you'll hear that idea of equity and of equal opportunity come across um, over the course of the presentation. Um, it's really embedded um, as the central piece of the Denver Foundation's work. The other thing that the foundation really affirmed as it was going through its strategic framework development process was that constituent or community leadership was something that was really critical. It was really important for the foundation to be out listening to the community on a very regular basis. It is very important for our grantees to be listening to the community on a regular basis. And it is very important for all of those parties to be listening to the community in a way that informed their work. And that's part of why we developed a strategic framework rather than a strategic plan. It's designed to be flexible, it's designed to be responsive to the needs of community, and it's designed to change over the 10 year term of the framework itself. The framework was informed by a pretty intensive community listening process, as Javier mentioned, that spanned both time before the pandemic and time once we uh, went to, to stay at home. We talked with over a thousand people directly um, and had you know, interaction with them about both their hopes for the metro area, as well as their perspective on the Denver Foundation. And then we also said to all of our community partners who were doing strategic planning processes at the same time that we were and asking the same questions, what are your hopes for the metro area? What are the challenges that you're seeing? We invited them to just give us their raw data and then we took all of that data and consolidated it with the help of the Colorado Health Institute to really give us the full perspective um, that we brought to the creation of the framework today. So what we heard was really what you would expect us to hear, that we want a connected community, that we want a community that's resilient, that we want equal opportunity for everyone and a strong community where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. We also heard some things that were maybe a little hard for us as a foundation to hear. For example, you need to simplify your grant making process. It's too complex for the amount of dollars that you give out as a, as a granting entity. But we heard some things that were really important for us as well, including that racial equity should continue to be a central tenant of the Denver Foundation, um, that we wanted to support nonprofits that were embedded in community and constituent leadership, and then some things that were brand new to the Denver Foundation. Um, so one of those was getting involved in policy and advocacy work. Um, the Denver Foundation has supported that work through its funding in the past, um, but we've never taken an active stance. 
And so we're in a position right now where we're really trying to understand where do we come up behind? Where do we come alongside? Where are we out in front? What do we do at a state level, a regional level, a local level? So that's an area that we would really love um, your perspective, either tonight or in a follow-up conversation, probably more likely. You know, where does the Denver Foundation have the ability to support local communities in the policy agendas um, that, that you each hold um, in terms of bettering your communities? And then the other thing that we heard really loudly and clearly was, you know, the Denver Foundation has an amazingly unique stakeholder base, um, very similar to what local government holds. It's broadly diverse in its political ideals. It's broadly diverse in its economic spectrum. It's broadly diverse in really every way. And so how can the Denver Foundation use that um, diversity to bring folks together for conversation in a way that transcends those differences and really gets at the core of the issues and the um, ideas that really make up our civic fabric as a community? Javier mentioned earlier something called donor advised funds. Um, that's where really generous philanthropists put dollars into the Denver Foundation and then grant them out over time. And what we heard from our donor advised fund holders was that the Denver Foundation really had um, some extreme value to them as it related to knowing community, being invested in community, knowing community organizations. And so part of the strategy in the donor advised uh, in the strategic framework is to more closely marry up our discretionary giving with our giving of our donor advised fund holders. And why that matters um, is that last year, $110 million went out from the Denver Foundation. Five million of that was through the Denver Foundation's discretionary grant making. The remainder was through its donor advised funds, discretionary funds, um, those kinds of things. And so really being able to bring together the value that the foundation brings in terms of its community knowledge with the donor resources that can actually support that community um, will bring, we think, a very different kind of power to the giving of the foundation. We saw that in spades during COVID, um, particularly during the early months where donors were working with the foundation, giving to the foundation, giving alongside the foundation, requesting research from the foundation. Dollars were rapidly going out the door, and we think we have the opportunity to do that around a whole variety of issues um, that are facing our community that are equally urgent um, and equally present um, for, for all of us. The foundation has also um, both kept in place and shifted some of its priorities in terms of its discretionary grant making through our community grants program, which if you talk to nonprofits in your community will be the program that nonprofits will best know the Denver Foundation for. Um, so, you know, some things are just the same in our economic opportunity area. Um, we're still focused on community wealth building, entrepreneurship, small business growth, workforce development. In education, we're still working on K-12 reforms, prioritizing racial equity. Um, those include things like the school to prison pipeline. Um, some things are brand new to us. School funding is an area that the Denver Foundation hasn't worked on before. Environment and climate, something that I know is near and dear to Dr. Cog's heart, really focusing on energy efficiency, renewable energy, air quality. Um, we'll really be leaning on you as a partner to help us as we enter that space. Housing, similarly, something that I know that you've worked on um, for a long time. You know, we're particularly focused on affordable housing at that lowest end of the income spectrum, um, as well as homelessness, and then transportation, my goodness, right in your wheelhouse, um, particularly public transit accessibility and affordability. We also have a category called civic fabric. Um, it's outside of the issue areas that we're focused on, but really supporting grass tops public policy efforts, community organizing, community convenings. Um, it's really about that kind of bringing folks together um, and, and furthering public policy that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention before turning it back to Javier is that we also made a real commitment to taking all of our assets under management, that billion dollars that Javier mentioned, and putting it all in, in a portfolio that really drives towards mission. Um, so we're looking at environmental social governance um, 
issues. We're looking at mission aligned investing. Um, and so, you know, the idea that really everything at the Denver Foundation is about drawing up the power and the full set of resources that the Denver Foundation has, whether that's its voice, whether that's its dollars, whether that's its convening power, whether that's its perspective, um, all of those things really coming together in this space. So let me turn it back to Javier to talk a little bit about um, some specific partnership opportunities that we see, and then we'll take some questions. Javier? Thank you, Desa. And just to build on that, you know, the, the bottom line is we want to bring all the tools in the toolbox to, to bear to drive impact. And we want to do that through partnerships. So it's not just about our resources, our assets, and, and what we can do as an organization. It's about who, who else is out there in, in the metro area, in the state of Colorado that we can partner with to, to really expand um, the impact that, that we're driving towards. And you know, that includes the, the public sector, frankly, as, as Desa said. And, and I think there's tremendous opportunity for us to be a partner um, to each of you um, as, as an organization, um, as well as individually in, in your different individual communities where, where we're doing work every, every single day. And some of the ways that that can occur is through our ability to manage and invest assets on, on behalf of government, on behalf of other philanthropic entities to distribute those assets into community, um, to help nonprofits to build capacity to do the great work that they're doing on the ground. Um, and then, you know, around convening of conversation and around engaging in policy and advocacy. And as you heard Desa say, th this is a, a new horizon for the Denver Foundation, but one that I think is absolutely necessary and, and critical for us to be involved in, because there are so many pressing issues that you all are on the front lines dealing with um, in this community that is growing so rapidly, changing so rapidly, and, you know, frankly, we'll, we'll start to face challenges as a result of that growth and, and all of that momentum. There's tremendous opportunity here, as you all know, um, but we want to make sure that we're being proactive and getting ahead of those challenges. And, you know, Desa talked about things like affordable housing and transportation. None of that needs to be explained to you all. We just are saying we want to be a partner in those conversations. If it, if it makes sense for us to convene stakeholders around those, those conversations in a way that, that creates a marketplace of ideas where people can come together, have different viewpoints, but in a respectful way say, you know, we're just here to, to advance solutions that will help solve these challenges. That, that's really what, what this is about, what this framework tees us up to do. Um, and again, I just wanna close by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you all. I, I do hope to meet all of you in person soon. Um, and, and certainly I am as relieved, I'm sure, as you all are, that it, it looks like there is light at the end of that tunnel. Thank you very much for that overview. That's really useful. And we look forward to discussion and working with you in the future. We are short on time, so we have time for maybe one or two questions, depending on how quickly they can come through. Any folks have questions this evening? We have one from Director Brockett. Hey, so thanks so much for that um, really fascinating presentation, all the amazing work that you're doing. So I, I represent the, the city of Boulder, and of course in Boulder County, we have a community foundation as well. And so I'm just curious to what extent there's cross collaboration going on between you all, Boulder County's community foundation and, and other community foundations in the area. Do you wanna take that Javier or you want me to take it? But you can start and I'll... <laughs> I, I'm just asking because Javier is like best friends with the CEO. <laughs> Community foundations. So um, there's a collaboration that happens. There's five community foundations in the Denver metro area, um, one focused pretty exclusively on Jefferson County, obviously Boulder County, the Women's Community Foundation, the Denver Foundation, and the Rose Community Foundation. And there are lots of opportunities for us to partner in terms of sharing ideas, um, sharing grantees, in many cases coming together in collaborative opportunities. For example, there's a um, coalition of uh, community foundations um, of which we're all a part that's fun talking about education funding. Um, so really working to coordinate resources um, and make sure that we're making the best use of both deep investment in nonprofit organizations, as well as broad, um, broad spread of funding across organizations. Um, it's really important to us that we're funding strategically um, and that we're not funding in a way that, um, that's kind of getting in each other's way or over, overbearing in one area and not another. That's great to hear. Thank you. 
and Aaron, I would just say, so Tatiana and I both moved to Denver from South Florida. Um, we both worked in philanthropy in South Florida prior to coming out here. Um, she's a good friend. She's a tremendous leader. Um, and I was really excited when she was named to head up the Boulder Community Foundation. Yeah, we're so fortunate to have her. She's doing amazing work. Well, thank you so much, everyone. If there's additional questions, you can send those to Brad Calvert on our staff, and he'll make sure that we follow up and get the answers to the whole board, and, and we can bring back the Denver Foundation in the future if need be as well. Thank you so much, everyone. So that's very much. Thank you. Thank you. That takes us to our next item, which is the report of the chair. And so first, I'd just like to announce um, that the, the um, Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog, has scheduled a public hearing for June 16th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. The public hearing is to receive comments on the proposed amendment to Dr. Cog's public engagement plan, people-centered planning, projects, and services. Further information about the public hearing is available on the Dr. Cog's website. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, the Performance and Engagement Committee Chair for a report on their committee meeting. Good evening. Thank you very much. Two weeks ago, we had a great committee meeting, very robust discussion in terms of looking at uh, plans for, for coming back together as, as a group and looking at, at ideas for that, and also dealing with the, the Dr. Cock retreat which typically has been an off-site retreat. Uh, this year will look a little bit different because we're not traveling to the mountains. A lot more details to come, but uh, that'll be coming up August 27th and 28th. That's a Friday and a Saturday, and that will be in town. And again, much more in the way of information will be coming. I had, just really want to thank the uh, Performance and Engagement Committee for a really robust, uh, I think, productive discussion looking forward. That's my report. Thank you, Director Conklin. That takes us to a report from the Finance and Budget Committee's chair. Director Shaw, if you're talking, we cannot hear you. Oh, you are talking. I see you there in the window. You're on mute. And yes, I was on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Finance and Budget has met twice since we last uh, reported. On May 5th, Finance and Budget held a special meeting where we recommended approval of the Dr. Cog fiscal year 2021-2022 budget to this board of directors, which comes up later in our agenda. Um, this evening, we met first as the Regional Response Incorporated, a 501c3 part of Dr. Cog that falls within the control and management of finance and budget. We approved the meeting minutes from last year and saw the presentation of our clean audit of RRI by Clifton Larson Allen. We met as finance and budget next, adopting a resolution authorizing the executive director to accept funds of approximately $300,000 from the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, HICPUF, from July 1, 21 to June 30, 22, supporting Dr. Cog's Community Options Program. We also authorized the executive director to continue a contract, contract with the Colorado Department of Human Services State Unit on Aging for approximately 388,000 for July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 22 supporting Dr. Cog's Aging and Disability Resource Center. We are briefed on the Dr. Cog 2020 audit as well. Many thanks go to Dr. Cog's staff and Clifton Larson Allen for a great deal of time and hard work represented in this audit. Madam Chair, this concludes my report. Thank you, Director Shaw. And that takes us to our next agenda item this evening, which is a report of our Executive Director, Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, everyone. I uh, have three items I want to uh, share with you this evening. First, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our award celebration, uh, which was held on, on April 28th, and I know many of you attended. It was our first ever virtual award celebration. Uh, at, I'm hoping, like all, get out. It's our last one. Uh, we had uh, we had over 300 registrants and 20 sponsors that, that participated. Um, Really, a big shout out to to the sponsors that, that helped us cover our costs and any, our direct expenses we had. We can't do these events without you, so we truly do appreciate that. Um, we did honor eight regional contributors with the Distinguished Service Award. Um, five outstanding Metro Vision projects were also 
uh, awarded the high, um, uh, the, the Metrovision Award. And our highest honor, the John B. Christensen Award, was um, was awarded to former Greenwood Village Mayor and Dr. Cog Director Ron Rakowski. Um, so it was it was it was an awesome night. And I would say that I would like to point out that uh, one of the highlights of this this whole event um, process was uh, we were able to attend a in person gathering at Greenwood Village City Hall earlier that earlier in April to present the John B. Uh, John B. Christian Award in person to Mayor Rukowski. That was great. It was nice to be able to be there in person with, uh, with Mayor Ron. And um, the executive committee were also uh, participated in that. And uh, it, 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 was, it was truly a great event. And I really want to give a big thanks to current Greenwood Village Mayor and Board Director George Lance for helping organize the event. It was, it was fabulous. Um, in that, in, in that award celebration, we are also able to uh, recognize our two outgoing chairs, um, both Bob Pfeiffer, who was, uh, would, have been, would have been recognized at the event if we had held it at the regular time last year. And of course, our immediate past chair, John Dyack, was also, was also recognized. So thank you both very much. Um, and a big shout out to Steve Erickson and Dr. Cog's staff in our communications and marketing department. It's a lot of work that goes into this, even a virtual event. It's amazing how much work and effort goes into that. And I know many of you have planned these in, uh, over the past year and a half of COVID. And uh, so please, thank you very much. Um, affordable housing ser series. I hope you guys have on your calendars um, to join us on Thursday, May 27th at 10 o'clock for our fourth and final virtual workshop on affordable housing. The focus of this workshop will be on creative and out of the box solutions. Um, some kind of, you know, um, uh, we'll have some some peer groups that will be present to to kind of share some of these some examples throughout the region and country. Um, and as a reminder, if you're un unable to attend those or haven't been able to attend um, any of the prior prior workshops, we have those available on our website. Just go to our events page, and you will be able to find those recordings. Last but not least, uh, we do have a call for projects that's open right now. It's for community mobility planning and implementation studies. Um, we um, uh, we had a you know compulsory workshop uh, a little while ago, and we got great turnout for that. But I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware to mention that the first phase of the application, which is a required letters of intent, are due to Dr. Cog's staff Friday, May twenty first. So you might want to pass that on to to um, to your staff. And with that, Madam Chair, that's my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. The next agenda item is public comment period. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests to, um, from the public to address the board, we'll allocate time at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment. I would request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. If any members of the public would care to comment, please raise it, your hand at this time by clicking on the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. If you've dialed in by phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine and a hand will appear and we'll be able to call on you. And so please raise your hand at this time. Our first member of the public that's going to address us this evening is Randall Loeb. Good to hear from you, Randall. Thank you, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Um, the fact is that um, we're in a beginning of phasing out our protective action, which I've been in um, by virtue of grace uh, since the beginning of the year. 70 people today were asked uh, to um, leave by the 15th of June. Uh, the whole program of uh, protective action has helped uh, uh, almost 800 people be safe during this uh, pandemic. Uh, I've, uh, 70 year old persons like myself are the last ones to uh, have to go. Um, but uh, you talked about affordable housing and really, we really need it. Uh, I was hoping that I could uh, speak more specifically to how we might be able to uh, take care of people who, for the most part, have nowhere to go. You can see that anytime you walk around, though, in the middle of cities, almost everywhere across the board. Uh, I am uh, myself trying to go to Fort Lyon uh, to be a support to their program in uh, Las Animas. 
but uh, we really have no choice but to come up with some plan to make it possible to extend what FEMA started by having us be able to be safe, to be able to have us to be stable and to improve the quality of our life so that we do not have to worry about dying on the street. And I would ask you, beg you, to consider this in each of your jurisdictions. I know some of you personally, and I know you care a great deal about this, and I know that you will do the best you can uh, to make it possible for all of us who live in this region uh, to be safe. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you. It is always, as I say, an honor. Thanks, good night. Thank you, Randall. Seeing no other hands raised for public comment at this time, we will go on to our consent agenda. Uh, could I please get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, Mayor Starker. Is there a second? Director second. Mauer? Director Mauer? I was just gonna second. Perfect, thank you. And just there are so many of us, it does really help if you can raise your hand. So thank you for dem demonstrating that, Director Mauer. That helps a lot. Um, any discussion of the motion, which is to approve the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. That takes us to our first action item, which is discussion on the fiscal year 2021 to 2022 budget. Jenny Dock, our Director of Administration and Finance, is going to tell us about it. Jenny? Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the time to be able to speak with you all tonight. I feel like um, we've talked a lot about budgets and audits lately, mainly because we are changing our fiscal year. Jenny? We aren't aware. Just, just uh, we're getting some microphone, like it, your microphone's kind of coming in and out. I don't know if it's like the headphone jack isn't plugged in all the way or what, but if, just so you know. Uh, let's see here. Is that better? Maybe my notes were. Yes, it is. Speaker. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So typically um, the way that the budget cycle works, present to you, um, that's been back and forth. Um, the way that the I think since the inception of Dr. Um, over the last couple of years, I brought to the board regarding how our funding has changed. The fact that now a large percentage of our funding actually does take place here, which is so we brought before you a calendar back in November. And we then came back to you in February and asked for approval. Hey, Jenny. I'm with that statement. Jenny, sorry to interrupt again. I just, can can I confirm with someone else that I'm not the only person with trouble hearing? Okay. Um, and so, and I didn't have this trouble during the finance committee meeting earlier. So I just wonder if you can try just double checking the microphone. Sorry about that. Try this again. I'm moving around a little bit. I think when you're closer to the computer, we can hear you better. I don't know if that was just Try that. Sorry. No, that's okay. Technical. Oh, that came in clear. Is that better? Yeah. I don't know if you can hold perfectly still. <laughs> Sorry. I about. will not move. All right. Hey, right here. Um, but no. So what we're what we are now presenting word is the new fiscal year. Um, and and I do want to thank Director Shaw, Budget Committee, for being so good about being on the schedule that was a little bit or hurry than usual to review the budget, make your recommendations, ask questions, send it to you all for approval. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Jenny, do you think you'd be able to try taking out your headphones? Sorry. I don't have headphones on. Oh, they're just beautiful earrings, sorry. <laughs> sorry. And I'm sorry, I have not had any problems with my microphone. No, and I've heard you clearly, I've heard you absolutely clearly before. Um, so I'm sorry for interrupting you so many times. That's okay. I'm a little at a loss of what to do. Yeah, maybe I will try turning off the video. Let's try that. That sounds like a great try. And then, and don't hesitate to tell me as yeah. I continue on. It's not working. And Jenny, you are absolutely the perfect and most wonderful person to give the presentation. But I wonder, Executive Director Rex, if I could ask you if you could give it by any chance or if there's someone else you could turn to. 
Well, we can certainly try. Myself, between myself and Director Shaw, I might be able to do this. Um, Jenny, you, you might try calling in, just FYI. All right, so she'll try to do that. And Director Rex, if you could give us your best impression of Jenny. And she really did a fantastic job at finance. So we will turn to the finance committee if there's anything left out. <laughs> Well, I will say with regards to the budget, I think Jen, this is what Jenny was trying to say is that, you know, we, we obviously we've changed our fiscal year. Um, I'll tell you that what you're seeing with regards to the budget is not much of a change from what you saw in the calendar year budget, um, simply because, um, uh, you know, obviously it's just six additional months that we have on the backside. Uh, I will tell you that we also, um, um, we also revised the work program that went with this. Um, we did remove some items that we believe that we will have finished by the end of this, um, by the end of June. And we add some additional ones as well that, that, um, that basically that, that complemented the, the budget. But um, the budget itself, again, as I suggest, suggested, it's not that much of a change. You can see we have for your comparison, the, the, uh, the, the 2021 calendar budget, as, and then next to that in, in the far right column, the 2021 to 2022 budget. Um, you can see there's not much discrepancies in, in, in either one. And if there's Director, any item or line item that you would like me to address, I'd be happy to do that. Just, if you could just remind everyone why we switched our fiscal year. We switched our fiscal year because we aligned better to the state fiscal year. The predominant money, this monies that we receive anymore are either state monies or federal monies that are that are passed through the state, so it just made a lot of sense from from our from our financials to align with that. So we're not dealing with state fiscal year, the federal fiscal year, and then our old Dr. Cog calendar uh, fiscal year. So um, it, it just made a lot of sense. We're able to to for for auditing purposes and that they gave a clear and more transparent picture of our finances. It just made more sense to do it on a on the state fiscal year. Thank you so much. And I'll give Director Shaw just a chance to add anything if you wanted to add anything at this time. Thank you. Yes, one of the things that I thought was important that was added to this budget was uh, accommodation for uh, staff salary increases. We had delayed those um, based on COVID and funding issues, but uh, I believe as of July 1st, they will be uh, uh, added in. So uh, that was a, a big thing. I think uh, the staff has been outstanding during this time and quite resilient and the opportunity to, uh, uh, to take care of them a bit is wonderful. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. And Jenny Doc has her hand up, so we will try again. Jenny? Going to try one more time. Perfect. I changed my location, so I don't know if that helps. Can you hear me we any can, better now? We can hear you right now. Hey, okay. No, um, I appreciate the comments. Are, I, yeah, I guess I just wanted to point out that mainly the budget's pretty flat. Um, presented a few months ago. I did want to point out what Director Shaw are really happy at Merit. Um, that was really important. Sorry, Jenny, we're only catching like every fourth word. And while I am interpreting what you are saying, I think it's really only because I've heard your presentation previously. So I am so sorry that it's not working this evening. Um, and if, if folks have questions, um, we're going to try our very best to answer them. And I'm sure, you know, someone will. And uh, Jenny, if we can't answer them, you can always type the answers in the chat. And so, you know, please folks don't feel like you can't ask questions on this if you have any. Um, this is now our discussion time for, for this uh, item this evening. Um, and then Director Rex, we won't be taking it up until next month, is that right? Sorry, we're taking it, sorry, you're muted. Are we acting tonight? Sorry, it says discussion on the agenda. Yes, we are. Is there a motion that you can put on the screen? for folks, if the time comes to that. Um, thank you. And yep, Jenny says that she needs approval tonight and if there are any questions, we'll get them right. So Celeste um, is in the uh, attendee list. Um, Executive Director Rex, is, is Celeste a director or a staff member? 
Uh, Sorry, Madam Chair. Sorry, uh, she, I she's an alternate and oh. her, her representative is present. Okay, great. Um, and so just a reminder to everyone, it's, it's easier to have all of these discussions in person as we're witnessing tonight. So we're all doing our very best, but when we have the um, meetings in the beginning of the month, they're more like study sessions. So everyone is moved over to the panelist side or in the boardroom, we would all be sitting around the table together, whether you're a member or an alternate and both people can be sitting there and participating. But when we're at the board meetings, only one member from each community can sit at the board table and vote and participate. So either the member or the alternate is welcome to do it, but we just can't have both. And so that's why we're not promoting uh, Celeste this evening, but it's absolutely nothing against uh, participation or attendance. We really appreciate that everybody's so engaged. So our first question or comment is from Director Brockett. Oh, Madam Chair, I'm just prepared to put a motion on the table when the time is right. Please, you can put the motion on the table to frame the discussion. That'd be fantastic. Great. Um, I move that we approve the Dr. Cog fiscal year 2021-2022 budget. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Jim Dale. Uh, thanks. Jim Dale is the second. And we have some other hands raised for discussion. And so, um, Director Venom. Actually, I raised my hand to uh, also second the motion. Thank you very much, sir. All right, any other discussion of the motion this evening? Seeing no other discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And I'm moving back up to my agenda. That takes us to our next agenda item, which is discussion on state legislative issues. And so Rich Morrow, our senior policy legislative analyst is going to take us through this. And again, just reminding everybody how we do this. First, we'll go through bills in which we've previously taken a position and get an update from Rich and see if we need to make any changes to our positions. And then after we're completed with that whole section, we'll go on to new bills. And um, just another reminder, we'll need two thirds of those present and voting to be able to take a position on any of the bills. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, directors. Um, so I think the first item you have in uh, is attachment D, the uh, bills that we've taken positions on before. And um, I, you know, in the interest of time, there really isn't anything significant to add to those. There haven't been any major changes. They, they've just been moving through the process and, and uh, you can see the uh, matrix that's included in the agenda. Um, and so unless there's any specific questions about any of the, the bills on that list, I would move to the, uh, the one new bill that we have to consider tonight. Is there any discussion or questions for staff on the bills in that list. I see a lot of people looking at it. So I'll give you just a moment to look that over. All right, seeing no questions. Rich, please move on to B, the new bills for consideration and action. Yep, so that's um, the uh, much awaited uh, transportation funding bill that we've all been uh, watching this year and um, that's the one that we're presenting uh, to you tonight for your consideration and possible action. Uh, the bill, as, and as I'm sure probably most of you know, you've probably been following this or heard it in other meetings, uh, has, has now passed through the Senate. It passed on third reading Monday morning or yeah, Monday morning and um, it was uh, amended um, a few times on second reading last week and um, I could give you a brief highlight of some of the uh, key amendments that might be of interest to you. Um, there was uh, um, some, some language to clarify that um, the bill, particularly that it was, I think it was section 28, it's now section 29 that dealt a lot with uh, uh, the um, environmental impacts and greenhouse gas reductions and those sorts of things. Um, to clarify that those, uh, that section uh, is addressed to the 10-year uh, plan and focused on uh, regionally significant projects. Um, I might characterize most of the amendments as attempts to 
to weaken that language, but um, you could also say that a lot of it was to clarify the intent of that language, depending on your perspective. Um, another piece, the, uh, you're aware that uh, the bill contains uh, the section on uh, the uh, RTA, Regional Transportation Authorities, um, and uh, what we refer to as the TPOs uh, added to that. Um, the only change, there was an attempt, actually an amendment attempted to, to remove that section that failed. Um, but there was an amendment, uh, as I read it, to just add to the notifications. There's a section in the RTA statute that requires uh, notification of like CDOT and local governments and entities that might be adjacent to the boundaries of a, of a RTA. And this added a notification for RTD if there was uh, um, adjacent to that. Um, and I think the last one I was gonna note is that uh, um, the bill uh, will be, um, it's, it's been introduced in the house now. I, I, I have, it'll be assigned to finance committee and is gonna be heard um, Monday afternoon. And with that, I think I will stop and see if, I think Doug and Ron were going to take over or be available. Madam Chair, if I may, this is Doug. You absolutely, and, and when you get to answering questions, there's a question in the chat. Oh, great, thank you very much. I just wanted to alert the, the board to the, um, the, the question and answer summary that was provided that, that Ron Papsdorf prepared in response to the uh, questions that were raised at the, um, at the board work session earlier this month. I just wanted to make sure everybody where that was in there. And thank you, Ron, for doing that. Great, thank you, uh, Executive Director Rex. And so we'll start with questions uh, or motions or comments on the topic at hand. And so the first question is posted in the chat uh, from Director Baker and it says, can anyone confirm the county allocation of HUTF funds from the bill will be based on the tier three formula? I believe that's the case, Ron. Uh, yeah, I don't think uh, there's been any change. Right there. I, I believe that that's, sorry, Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog. Um, <clears throat> I believe that's, that's true, although I haven't investigated that specific question and I, I'd have to read through, there's several references in the bill. So I'd, I, can, I can get back to, um, uh, Director Baker um, and the board with an answer to that after I have a chance to investigate after the meeting. Thank you. Other discussion, discussion points or comments? I'm seeing no hands raised. <laughs> a simple little bill. Director Dyack. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, just uh, just uh, responding to, to this, uh, I brought this issue to the, to the Town of Parker Council. Uh, we talked a lot about it Monday night. Um, you know, our, our uh, discussion largely was around, um, you know, I think uh, just looking back, uh, the ideology, um, you know, taxes versus fees. Uh, some were kind of concerned about that. Um, at a higher level, the discussion was, what is this, what is this bill trying to achieve? Are we trying to um, solve one thing, um, solve a little bit of everything? Um, when we talked about it, um, the, the, the term jack of all trades, master of none kind of came, uh, came to mind uh, with a few of us. So it, it, it seems like we're trying, to, um, we're trying to spread the peanut butter, if you will across different initiatives. And to me, it just doesn't kind of solve any of them or, or further any of them, at least from the Parker Council's perspective. So you know, with that, um, Parker uh, has directed me to, to oppose um, this, this bill. Um, and um, at this point in time, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Director Dyack, Director Williams. I muted there, sorry, took a sec. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just wanted to uh, express, express my support for this bill. 
you know, I, I do think uh, it is certainly not perfect. Um, you know, we, we've gone through it, looked at the, the funding opportunities, kind of the vehicles for, uh, for, for increasing that funding, uh, uh, and even some of the, these most recent amendments, um, some potential concerns about redefining uh, clean vehicles on that. That being said, uh, do think kind of, as was mentioned in our work session, you know, this bill is a reflection of a broad uh, outreach effort, a broad engagement effort, and do think that, you know, despite some, some definite peanut butter spreading, Director Dyack, agree with you on that, um, that it is, it is worthwhile uh, and could really be a huge benefit. And, you know, we've had a lot of challenges, think of, you know, uh, Prop 110 here, getting these across the finish line. This seems like it's got a real chance and, and Denver is, uh, and, and myself would be, will be supporting it. Thank you, Director Coombs. Um, yes, I was also able to get some direction from the city of Aurora from our federal, state, and intergovernmental relations committee, and they did agree to support this bill. So I will be supporting it. Thank you. Um, Director Odoricio. Thank you. Um, for the reasons actually stated earlier, um, unfortunately, uh, with Director Dyack, we, we think that the spreading of the uh, peanut butter and trying to find compromise was actually the reason why we're supporting it. Um, th this is our only, this is the best chance that we've seen in years to come up with a statewide solution. Yes, this body here, Dr. Ka could possibly in the future come up with their own solution, but uh, that doesn't really help the whole state and it doesn't really help this group either because at the end of the day, uh, we're an interdependent community of, of communities in the state. And so we really believe that this is, uh, there was a lot of work put into stakeholding, uh, a lot of compromise. Uh, yes, not, not let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good in this situation. We have, um, there's some big wins for local government uh, as far as uh, retention of the HUTF in many situations, as well as the expansion of additional uh, programs, whether it's the multimodal you care about or the EV or even just um, the non-attainment, which affects absolutely everyone on this call. So we believe that this is truly the, the best opportunity for a statewide solution uh, that we've seen in years. Uh, we think that uh, our tax uh, payers, our constituents are, are, are tiring of, of the disputes and the conflict. Uh, at the end of the day, this is one of the best examples that we've seen of people coming together from very different perspectives and finding a compromise. So we think this is one of those opportunities rare opportunities where we might be able to celebrate some compromise and, and advancing uh, something that's important. So we're gonna be supporting this. I would hope we can urge everyone to do the same. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Gipp. Thank you. I just wanted to mention that the uh, Erie Town Board did have a discussion about this at, their, uh, at our meeting last Tuesday and we did uh, have decided to Put strong support and create actually a resolution in support of this. So we will, I will be voting in support of it. Thank you, Director Brackett. I, well, I think uh, Director Odoricio put it very well. You know, I think this is, uh, it's a real compromise. Uh, I don't think anybody uh, feels like uh, all of their priorities are getting addressed in exactly the way that they would like them to. But I think everybody feels that way. I think so is the makings of a good, a good compromise. And as, as you all know, we've tried over and over again to get uh, statewide additional transportation funding and effort after effort has failed. And meanwhile, our infrastructure is crumbling and the uh, additional investments that we need to support the mobility needs of our growing population are going unmet. Um, so uh, the city of Boulder, we uh, sat down together and agreed uh, also to not let the perfect be the enemy the good and are supporting this. In fact, uh, our mayor, Sam Weaver, was at the initial press conference for it. So um, we will be uh, supporting it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you, Director Shaw. Thank you. I also speak in favor of, of uh, Dr. Cog supporting this bill. Uh, it is far from perfect. It, it is also our best chance of getting any kind of transportation funding. So we believe it is worth a try. There may be... Uh, it may end up being a, a decision of the court whether or not the money actually comes through, but uh, 
we believe it is uh, worth a shot. And so we are in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Director Linsett. Thank you. Uh, the Broomfield City Council last week uh, almost unanimous, unanimously agreed to support this bill. Um, I think the, the, the group of stakeholders behind this bill is almost historic. You know, we, we rarely get bipartisan coalitions like this uh, uh, on, on such hot topic items. So um, I will be supporting this bill tonight. And to uh, Director Dyack's uh, analogy, um, I can't think of anything worse than a peanut butter sandwich without any peanut butter. So I think it's time to, time to move forward. Thanks. Thank you, Director Wheelock. Uh, yes, I, um, <clears throat> I, I'd like to point out that, that from Clear Creek County, we're kind of in a unique position as a, as a member of Dr. Cog, but also somewhat rural and also reflects some of the, uh, uh, the, the sensitivities of the rural areas of the state that have been, that, that are often left out. And I think the HUTF formula uh, and its use and its distribution has won over a lot. And I think also it's the idea that that there are many areas of rural Colorado that now support this too. And to be able to have this much support behind it is a very historic thing. The first job I had here uh, 50 years ago uh, in November was working on the Eisenhower Tunnel, which birthed the largest single chunk of the second largest piece of the economy in the state, which is tourism. And it, was, it couldn't have happened without the kind of investment and forward thinking and sacrifices uh, that we made, even though that's not in the Dr. Cog region. And yet, uh, that kind of thinking, uh, that, that was completed, that in Glenwood, Glenwood Canyon was completed in 92, and that's the last time we had any significant commitment and investment to, to statewide solutions. And I think both CDOT and the legislature made a very hard effort uh, in going around the state, in the cities and the rural areas to find out what everybody needed. They created a 10 year plan that's only 40% funded. And in fact, we do need to spread the peanut butter over the rest of that sandwich and cover the rest of the 60%. And this goes a long ways towards doing that. And I think especially the fact that they balance so well between both pavement and multimodal strategies as well, address greenhouse gas issues to the extent that they can be. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a very solution oriented thing. We support it completely. And uh, I think the fact that we have so much rural and urban support for this is extremely important. It's our last chance, I believe, to have a statewide solution that does not cause a balkanization of, of um, transportation funding throughout the state here forward. As each piece of the five major MPO areas falls off and creates their own RTA, those voters would never vote again to, for another statewide measure to do something in another part of the state after they tax themselves. This is a great chance to get it right, and a great chance for, I think, the legislature and, and organizations like Dr. Clogg to show the leadership that's needed to finally get something done here after around 30 years. Thank you, Director Venom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the need uh, is self-evident. Uh, my study of uh, Senate Bill 260 has a lot of merit but in my opinion, falls short of um, what is needed. So I will be uh, joining Director Dyack and voting no. Thank you. And um, not seeing anyone who hasn't made a comment yet. I see uh, Director Dyack has his hand up and we'll let him go um, in just a minute, just giving people a chance who haven't had a chance to comment. Director Kraftarp. Thank you. So Jefferson County did meet, we did talk about this. Um, this is the opportunity. We have tried to do transportation funding, especially on a statewide for a long time. When you have a big package like this, you're not gonna be pleased with everything in it, but you need to be looking at um, what are the pieces that will help your community? And is this a step forward? If we don't pass this, the legislature is not gonna try this again for a couple of years. So I think this is our moment. We need to support this. Thank you. Um, I'll just add my voice in at this point. Um, so I hesitate to really say anything because I think regardless of what we do tonight, they're going to pass this out of the legislature. I don't think that they're taking input or actually are interested in what we have to say. But setting that aside, I just think it's important um, to clarify why I'm making the vote that I am so that you know after the vote, people aren't confused. Um, I can't support this as it's written. Uh, it's 
fatally flawed in a number of ways. It has a very low percentage going to multimodal. The bill likely increases greenhouse gas emissions and BMT, although no one has actually taken the time to calculate that. Uh, section 34 that talks about the additional taxing authority for TPOs. You'll all remember I gave a, a visual demonstration of why that was a bad idea at the last meeting we had in person, and I still vehemently oppose it. I think we could have areas that are accidentally included in the taxing authority that don't want to be taxed. And I think that there should be clear documentation of why you're in a taxing authority and how you can get out. We have seen with RTD and other RTAs that this is already very problematic. Um, and so um, on, on top of all of those things, one very problem area is the retail delivery tax. Uh, this new tax is incredibly regressive, adding 27 cents to every delivery for every person. And that's really predominantly going to be in the metro area, but distributed across the state. So this regressive tax will impact our community members in a way um, for years to come, and we won't see the return on that investment. So that's really challenging for our community members, especially when they have you know, families with children that are having deliveries for food and things like that, because they have working parents are going to be charged these 27 cent fees on meals that are delivered to their homes, and then that fund funding will not be returned into their community, but spent somewhere else in the state. So because of these things and more, I won't be supporting it tonight, but I do really appreciate the um, lively debate and look forward to hearing more. Any other comments? Director Dyack. I hesitate to follow you up, Madam Director. Um, thank you so much for the information. Again, I, um, I, as well as the town of Parker, do recognize that um, there is a need for additional transportation funding. You know, I think, but just to kind of follow up and to, to summarize all of the things Madam Chair um, um, gave us in, in her narrative. Uh, the only thing that, that I have uh, remaining on my list was um, Parker is more projects driven. Um, you know, there was a list, a CDOT list, and it, it was only a CDOT list uh, probably about four years ago that had $9 billion of priority projects. Um, you know, and, and this, this only provides 5 billion. And again, it goes to projects and programs. So. You know, that was a challenge as, you know, again, it doesn't really solve, solve anything. And um, it, it creates uh, additional enterprise funds, which will only need to be funded more. And uh, where is that additional money going to come from? I think over and above what this tax gives, uh, you're going to need to find additional monies to, to, to feed those enterprise funds. So um, again, just, um, yeah, I appreciate everybody um, and everybody's thoughts. Um, thank you so much. And um, I will give it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wheelock. Just like to say that um, uh, I, I appreciate the concern about this being a bill that doesn't do enough. It's like every bill we've ever passed. If we never passed a bill or never made a decision to do anything until we could do everything, we would never do anything. And uh, so I think that at some point we have to at least do part of what it is we're supposed to do. You know, I guess until, you know, we've got to do the laundry and the dishes and a whole lot of different things to get the job done before it's over. And we have to start with something. And we know that we have, um, we know we have neglected transportation, honestly, to the extent that we should have in Colorado for 30 years. And so I appreciate very much that it's going to cause pain to all of us. I think we're spreading the pain evenly and we're spreading as much of the peanut butter as we can to do as much of the job as we can out of this. And I think that, that this is about as far as we can go this year. And without it, we're gonna be hurting a lot more for a long time. And we're gonna have a, a less organized and, and, and a less visionary funding system going forward for a long time as well. So I do support it again. And that's the last thing I'll say. Thank you, Director Wheelock. Would anyone like to put a motion on the table to frame the conversation further or just to move us along, Director Wheelock? Yeah, uh, I would move that we support. Thank Second. you. Uh, Director Odorizio, was that you? Yep. Thank you. And, and I do want to ask Randy to, I was trying to write that down. If we didn't, if we waited to do anything until we did everything, we would, I want to, I need that written down at some point. And I, I'm going to use it, Randy. That's the second time somebody's asked me something like that in two days. And both times I forgot what I said by the time. Oh. Uh, uh, Brilliant. Lucky for you, Director Odorizio, these are recorded and you can go back and watch it when you are having trouble <laughs> sleeping. So there you go. Totally. Is there any other discussion of the motion to take a position of support? 
Seeing no other discussion of the motion, could I get those in favor to please raise their hands? Using the raise hand icon that you'll find at the bottom. Using the raise hand. Did it. Did it. Oh. The motion carries the, uh, there are more than two thirds of the hands raised. Thank you everyone. So we don't need to see the abstentions or the no's if everyone's okay with that. Good, not seeing or hearing any objection. Um, Rich, do you have anything else for us this evening? I do not, Madam Chair. Thank you. That takes us to our next agenda item, which is an informational briefing. We look forward to this every single year this is something by statute we are required to have presented from RTD. This is a fantastic evening, and I'm sure that we won't be disappointed from Director Bill Van Meter from RTD. He's the Assistant General Manager of Planning, and he's going to give us the fantastic briefing on the status of the RTD Fast Tracks projects. Thank you, Chair, and I am not good at starting a PowerPoint and speaking coherently at the same time. So PowerPoint is up. Yes? Yes, sir. Looks All great. right. Now I'll try to um, switch into that mode. So thank you for that introduction. Yes, this is the 2021 Fast Track Status Report. And um, let me just dive right in. Uh, I'll spend most of my time talking about Fast Tracks and providing Fast Tracks financial information and the status of Fast Tracks as um, the title of the presentation and the annual report is um, uh, posits or um, um, provides for. But I also want to provide updates on the accountability committee work, reimagine RTD in the system-wide fair and study and equity analysis and discussions with Dr. Cog staff. They particularly requested that I provide brief highlights and recaps um, on those three topics and happy to accommodate that. This map shows as of 2021 in purple the completed fast tracks corridor projects. In dashed green the four corridors that remain unfinished. And it's a good kind of map or graphical depiction of the information that is on the following slide in this report, which details in tabular form the kind of the um, completion date of each of those projects that have been completed to date as part of Fast Tracks. The four corridors that remain unfinished are completion of North Metro, from 124th to 162nd Avenue. The Southwest Extension, um, uh, south along Santa Fe from Mineral to C470 and then east on 470 to Lucent. The Central Corridor Extension from 30th and Downing up to a connection with the University of Colorado A-Line. And the Northwest Rail Corridor B-Line from Westminster to Boulder and to Longmont. So as I noted in my report last month, that particular corridor, um, the Northwest Rail Corridor has been a uh, subject of uh, keen interest uh, continually and heightened interest in the past few months. I wanna just give a real quick recap of where RTD is heading on the Northwest Rail Corridor. In February, we provided our board of directors, staff, being the we, sorry, um, and uh, history and current status of the Northwest Rail Corridor as part of the larger Fast Tracks program. In March, staff held jurisdictional engagement meetings with six jurisdictions in the corridor to discuss um, needs, expectations, desires, and situation in some detail with those jurisdictions with elected officials and staff um, from those jurisdictions. In April, our board of directors was presented by staff 
some options for moving forward with a peak service plan on the Northwest Rail Corridor. I talked about this last month with the board, but just to remind you, that would be three trips in the morning from downtown Longmont through Boulder to Denver Union Station and three trips in the afternoon peak period from Denver Union Station reversing along the corridor to downtown Longmont. The board of directors gave RTD staff direction to go ahead and prepare cost estimates and the scope of work in collaboration with the local jurisdictions for a uh, uh, essentially a planning and environmental linkages study that would allow us to move to 30% design and with and environmental work and planning work to support and a, a robust analysis of this peak service plan, including stakeholder and public engagement. Our next and more immediate step is to go back to our board this summer with that scope of work, with input again from local jurisdictions and, um, and ask them for funding authorization, presumably from the Fast Track's internal savings account to move forward on that study for Northwest Rail peak service plan. Again, the dates of completion on projects completed to date. This table, I won't, I'll spare you the pain of, re, of my reading the numbers, but it is an accounting of the capital dollars spent on program, on the Fast Tracks program through 2020 and total pro, project budget for each of the projects within the Fast Tracks plan. This was part of your materials. And I'll really spare you the pain of me trying to read all of the numbers on this, um, on this slide. It was also included in your materials. But I do want to spend a little time letting you have a good understanding of what you're looking at here. First thing I'll note is this varies slightly from the materials that were included in the board package, the board agenda package for this evening, in that in response to Dr. Cog's staff request, we added actual 2019 expenditures. Um, and I understand that this information will be posted by Dr. Cog tomorrow so that you'll have access to it. So we added the 2019 actuals column to provide more robust understanding of um, the uh, current financial status of Fast Tracks. This is not all of RTD, this is a Fast Tracks specific look. And it's updated from a forecast that was adopt, presented to an, and um, informed the board last year as part of our midterm financial plan, our six year financial plan effort in November of 2020. It's been updated with the latest sales and use tax forecasts from the University of Colorado Lead School and to reflect some refinancing um, which was to the benefit of the program finances over the long term. So this is our financial forecast for the years 2021 through 2026. You'll note that the net cash flow and cumulative remaining funds rows at the bottom are blank, and that's due to the negative cash balance, negative cash flow, I should say, over this period for fast tracks. The um, um, analysis shows RTD needing to use reserves to maintain a a balanced budget during this six year period. The future year def deficits are continuing, you can see that, and reserves are forecast to eventually be depleted. In other words, the better financial forecast from the CU Lead School business from March of this year, I'll spit this all out, as well as the impact, um, positive impact of finances of our refinancing simply delays the complete exhaustion of fast tracks reserves. That's our current situation. We will be updating this forecast in the latter half of 2021. We'll have a better understanding of the impact of CRISA and ARPA funding, for example, uh, better understanding of 
how our fare box revenues, which you can see 2019 versus 2020 and 2021 on, took a significant hit uh, as a result of drops in ridership from COVID. And um, we'll have um, better and updated information available at that time. But this is our current forecast and we wanted to provide that information to you. The end of our discussion, I'll do my best to answer questions if you have any about that. Um, switching gears, that was my attempt at a relatively rapid fire summary as to where we stand on fast tracks, um, moving into the accountability committee. You're aware we've briefed the board, I've briefed the board in the past at the accountability committee, an 11 person committee. Um, created last June, July timeframe at the behest and request of the governor and um, in cooperation with the legislature and RTD, that 11 member body has been meeting very frequently and regularly um, over the past many months to develop their recommendations that are expected to be finalized by July 1st of this year, the RTD Accountability Com um, Committee. A big shout out to Dr. Cog's staff. Dr. Cog's staff have um, worked tireless, tirelessly to support the Accountability Committee's work over that time period to manage their consultant contract um, with North Highland, who has brought information and insights to the committee as they've done their work. And uh, I know it's been quite, quite the effort for Dr. Cog's staff to make sure that that accountability committee work has been well represented, fed and developed. A brief note, the House Bill 1186, which was based on the initial accountability committee recommendations that were made late last year, early this year, it has passed and is waiting the governor's signature. If you want more information and recap on on that item, it is in tonight's board package under the um, pieces of legislation that Dr. Cog is tracking. And in fact, Dr. Cog uh, took a position of support on that legislation. So it has passed and is awaiting um, the governor's signature. Director Van Meter, if you'll just yes. pause there for a moment and we'll let some questions flow in and then I'll let you jump back in. So first question is from Director Mauer. You bet. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Bill, um, for your report. Um, just can we go back to the, your financial plan summary where you added the column for 2019? Indeed. And, and you show, or the table shows, 2019, the fare of 43,000. And then I'm not seeing it catch up again until possibly 2026. Is what, what are we looking at? Why are we not catching up when we get back to being normal? That's, um, that's how we see it right now. We're trying to be very conservative and reasonable in our expectations of fare box recovery um, or fare box revenue generation. Um, for both our base system forecasts as well as our fast tracks forecasts. As I recall, and I'm going off the top of my head, um, so I don't want to put specifics on anything here, but to date this year, our fare box revenues are actually trending lower than our forecast for 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, so mm -hmm. We're not certain as to what the ridership response and um, how robust our ridership is going to return and whether it will return to pre-pandemic levels with things such as um, work from home policies, the ETRP and other, um, other uh, impacts to uh, potential impacts to our ridership. We're trying to get a be better handle on that. Time will tell. Hopefully, those numbers go more positive than you see there. Another um, consideration, which I'll, I'll be speaking to a little bit later, is also the potential for our bo board to handle our fares and our fare structure, which um, many board members and I believe people 
on the Dr. Cog board and elsewhere believe are too high. And if we were to lower fares, that would impact those fare box revenues as well. Thank you, that helps. Yeah. Thank you, Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you could go to the preceding slide. Uh, yeah, I had a question. So on the Northwest Rail Line um, budget or a comparison of spent through um, 2020 and total project budget, 28 million is not, what is that supposed to represent? Because that is definitely not the cost of uh, the no. total project. So what does that represent? Thank you for the question. It is, this, this table represents actuals and committed expenditures. So to date, RTD has spent about $11.3 million on the Northwest Rail Corridor. That's primarily in support of engineering and um, planning and environmental work. The 28 million is, represents that 11.3 million that has been spent to date, as well as um, a substantial portion of that is RTD's commitment to the Longmont end of line station. So RTD has money that was committed uh, a number of years ago to work in partnership with Longmont to create the, um, uh, to, to fund the park and ride in station at the end of line of, near first to Maine. So these are actuals expended through 2020, as well as total committed budget to date. Okay, that's helpful. So that's committed budget, because I was wondering if, if we look at the North uh, Metro line, which also has an uncompleted segment to it, the, the northernmost segment. And that, so I take it that that $852 million uh, total project budget is not what it would, um, is not the difference or the additional increment that it would take to complete. Correct, it, it's, okay. ex, it's remaining expenditures um, to complete and finalize property acquisitions and final punch list items and other outstanding commitments on the currently completed project to 124. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Levy. Director Seitz? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a quick question on the next slide. Yes. So um, similar, um, Previous question, looking at 2019 um, for, let's see there, uh, row number four, grants and other incomes, that's a pretty huge drop. And I, I guess um, maybe I'm not familiar enough with this to understand what exactly is represented in that and why it has so dramatically fallen and it does not look like we see that as a significant source of revenue in the future. Yep, good. Thank you for that question. Um, so the grants and other income are primarily federal grants that helped fund quarter projects. Um, the substantial portion of the monies that you see in 2019 and 2020 are federal new starts or um, capital investment grant funds that supported con um, construction of the Southeast Corridor Rail Extension, which was partially funded through federal grants. So that project is done. None of the um, remaining fast tracks corridors are currently eligible for federal funding. And that's part of the binder predicament, frankly, that um, RTD has in terms of being able to find the funding and financing for the unfinished fast tracks corridors. So the substantial portion of that are um, those federal grants in 2019, 2020 for the Southeast Rail Extension. There's also some other revenues in there, some other smaller grants, as well as the five-year, I think it was five-year, um, agreement for the naming rights of the University of Colorado A-Line um, with the University of Colorado. And so those, that agreement ended earlier this year, if I have that, if I have the timing correct on that, that's why you see nothing in 2021. Then 
the federal government has a program to help keep um, fixed guideway projects, rail or bus rapid transit projects throughout the country in a state of good repair. And that program, quarters become eligible to receive funding from that program about nine years after they've been completed. So you see a ramp up mm. back of grant dollars in the future as previous projects cross that nine, I think it's nine year, it's technically seven years, but then you have to wait a couple of years before you become eligible um, or before the money flows. Um, so after projects have been open for that length of time, the federal government does support um, with grant revenues to help keep that project in a state of good repair. Then I have one last question, if that's okay with the chair. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in the report, I noticed there was kind of a footnote of potential, um, I, I don't know if it, they were liabilities or not, but talking about um, potential settlement with DTP, do you have an anticipation, like what does that mean for the budget and is, is what, what could that potentially mean for the fast tracks uh, finance, finances? Or is that too, uh, too much of an unknown? It's too much of an unknown, too speculative, and I am not part of and have not been privy to the proceedings around that, but it, it is a potential real liability to the fast tracks budget. Okay, thank you so much for answering my questions. I appreciate the report, it was very informative. Thank you, um, Director Seitz, Director Vidham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as I, I look at these uh, numbers, the really grisly number is the drop in uh, fair revenue. So uh, Bill, does, does RTD or Fast Track have a uh, active marketing plan to try and find a new ridership? Yeah, you know, RTD is really just um, um, delving into, I shouldn't say embarking because we have been thinking about it for a while, but really starting to delve into what um, our general manager has termed the road to recovery discussion. Um, you know, so recognizing that currently our service is at about 60% of pre-pandemic levels. Ridership is not recovering to date. Um, noticeably, I just spoke with our service planners who um, have their finger on the pulse just last week and ridership is not changing noticeably to them. Um, it's at 40% of pre-pandemic levels. We still have distancing and mask requirements on the vehicles. Um, a really you know, ambiguous future. What's the timing for the achievement of herd immun immunity, as I referenced earlier, telework, work from home, um, on, on campus versus remote instruction at college campuses and at schools. Um, we have participated in Denver's Ready effort led by the city and the partnership as an effort to welcome employees back to downtown. We've been talking some with TMOs and TMAs and others about how to position the ETRP and um, a change back to at least um, we expect for many people a hybrid return to work approach as they're returning and changing their commute patterns and, and returning to a commute, making sure that they're aware, available of what RTD services are. We have some ad campaigns that we have worked trying to assure people that riding transit is safe. There's been no proof of, um, of spread of COVID in any um, mass uh, uh, transmissions nationally, nor of course, certainly locally. And so we're, we're doing some soft work like that and some hard work behind the scenes, talking with employers and schools, trying to understand what their return to work and return to school looks like and make sure our services are going to be aligned. And we're talking with our board right now about what our marketing, marketing can look like 
but I don't have a robust answer and response to that question. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your heartfelt comments. May I just toss out the thought that someplace out there is an advertising agency with some really smart people that might uh, be an ally for you. Yeah, and, and as our board's um, thinking through these very same issues and discussing, discussing that and working on this road to recovery, we're calling it, um, that is a key piece that I know that they're interested in. And I will talk with our communications and marketing group about that. Thank you, Director Vidam. Um, Director Van Meter, I have a couple questions myself. Um, on this slide here that you're showing, this is just the fast tracks portion uh, of the right. budget, right? Yeah. So did you allocate any of the CARES uh, funding in that grant and other income line over to the fast track side, or was that all put on the base side or some hybrid? Um, the CARES Act funding, I believe, we used it um, on both CRISA and ARPA allocations have not been drawn yet. And that's my, um, that's my uninformed, not the CFO of RTD's answer. So that, so you're thinking, and I understand what you just said, you don't, ex maybe don't exactly know, but you're thinking that that would be not included in the grant revenue here then if it hasn't been decided right. on the application yet. So, so the notes um, from our CFO for me regarding this topic were that um, additional financial challenges, okay. Qualifying expenditures for the additional CRISA and ARPA, that's the two um, funding packages passed this year. That was, uh, portioned to RTD in 2021. Um, how those apportionments are divided between fast tracks, qualifying fast tracks expenditures and base expenditures um, are one of the items that is not clear to me. Okay. I'm just straight if, and transparent. Thank you. And so some kind of process will be used to take input because it, like, it could be on a per mile basis, it could be on a per capita basis, it could be on a ridership basis, and all of those would change then the allocations. And the reason that matters to communities, of course, is because we're always looking at are we getting regional equity? And depending how you allocate that, it would significantly impact regional, the regional equity calculation. So is there going to be some kind of process to give feedback on how that might be done? I will get an answer back to this body. Thank you, sir. And so you would expect some of those revenues in 2020 and in 2021, is that what I heard? Or would they all yeah, be- Yeah, and, and, and likely beyond. So um, the intent of CRISA and ARPA funding is to support ongoing operations to, um, keep agencies afloat from an operational standpoint to keep operators and frontline workers employed. Um, and so there are operating expenses. You can see them in 2021 on this chart at 100, on line seven, 155 million and growing over time. And uh, we do not anticipate drawing down all of the CRISPR funding in 2021, in fact, um, a key piece of our allocation is $30 million per run board. There are three run boards a year over 2021 and 2022. So our intent is to be able to use th these funds over a longer period of time to keep our operating both base and fast tracks as robust as those funds will allow us. Thank you, that's a great, that sounds like a great plan. Thanks for doing that. Um, my next question is around the fair revenue, like other directors were asking, ha has the board talked about, or have you been hearing that there, uh, that folks aren't riding because the express routes have been taken away? And so it makes it incredibly inconvenient to get on these regional paths. Have you been hearing that feedback? We have not been hearing much of that feedback, no. Um, in fact, you know, to date, uh, our, 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 our 
back up. Um, almost immediately in mid-March of last year, our ridership on those commute-oriented routes dropped precipitously. And sure. we have not heard an overwhelming um, response from past and hopefully future riders or others saying that at this time, that's here. We have an expectation and we have an expectation talking with um, stakeholders with downtown Denver partnership, which is one of our lar largest markets, as you know, for those services um, with um, folks at University of Colorado, um, the TMOs, TMAs with uh, partnership in the city and county of Denver, that that situation is going to change in the coming months as we return to the new normal and um, how we balance a budget that does not allow the same level of operations pre-pandemic as post-pandemic is something that is a key piece of this road to recovery and strategic planning discussions that the RTD board is ha having because those pressures are not here today that I'm aware of or have heard of in any sort of um, mass amount, but we know it's coming. Thank you. And just from my community, what I'm hearing from people is like that businesses are expecting folks to start coming back in part time, like maybe three days a week in June. And so community members are reaching out to council because they're looking at the routes and see that their routes are missing. And so they're making choices now about whether or not to fill their MyRide card or to buy their EcoPass again because they let it expire. And so because their express routes aren't there, they're making other plans. And so there's like, they're, you know, even though that ridership will lag, I think if we're not looking ahead and at least telling people like, yes, the plan is that there'll be express routes in June, or yes, there'll be commuter routes in July, then they can't make appropriate plans ahead of time. And I would encourage staff and the board to really look at the past programs in a quick turnaround, because if you've got a bunch of people working in downtown two days a week, they will not renew their eco pass and you do not want to lose all of those past programs for good. And so I think there should be special pandemic pricing to try to retain those pan those pass holders. Otherwise, I think you have lost an entire group of riders permanently, you know, that they just ride because they have a pass. I mean, it's just so convenient. And if you don't have them, then they start making driving choices for other things other than the, the commute as well. So just encourage you that way. And then if you don't mind, one more question, if you go back to the previous slide, it would be really wonderful to get this exact thing only adjusted for inflation and construction inflation. So these are all, I believe, just in dollars, like in the dollars that were actually spent in whatever year they were spent. But we, of course, always hear about how, you know, the price of steel, the price of concrete, the price of, you know, this, that, and the other. And we've seen these great graphs that show what they were over time, that right. that significantly impacted future costs. Mm -hmm. So this is a great graph to see. And then it would also be helpful to see what all of these spent through 2020 is if you adjusted all these dollars into 2020 dollars, as if you had to do the project again today, considering construction inflation. So if I could get that, I would think it was absolutely fantastic. Any other questions or comments from folks? Not seeing any, and so we'll turn it back to you, Director Van Meter, to carry on. Thank you. Um, so that discussion was segueing nicely into Reimagine RTD. So Reimagine RTD is looking at, uh, um, is back. It was put on pause as I reported to the Dr. Cog board last August by the RTD board of directors, given the uncertainties that we're still facing and talking about, but that were even more heightened at that time in terms of um, the impacts of COVID on RTD and on the economy as a whole. Also in recognition of uh, change in leadership at RTD and anticipating Deborah Johnson as well as new RTD board members, it was paused last August. We have restarted it. Our, a lot of our focus is on this mobility plan for the future, which I'll dive into in a second. But to um, one of Chair Stoltzman's points in, in our dialogue that we just had, as part of Reimagine RTD, 
we have we are est establishing a, sec a separate committee asking technical working group and and, and advisory committee members that are part of the reimagine RTD um, committee structure and represent many organizations and communities and Dr. Cog um, throughout the region. We're forming a separate subcommittee to focus on those issues of how RTD builds back service, given our constraints, given the real demands that we anticipate as people start returning to work and to school how does RTD, as nimbly as RTD can, um, and given the financial constraints, move forward in the near term in response to a return to the new normal? On a parallel path, we're also looking at developing fiscally constrained and needs-based plans, financial plans, and supporting plans for RTD through the year 2050 to coincide with the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan just adopted by the, the Dr. Cog Board. Um, and so as part of this longer term planning process, putting together both fiscally constrained and needs-based plans, we are working over the course of the next year and into early 2022 to look at customer engagement, to look at market and demand and travel demand analysis over the longer term using Dr. Cog's models and forecasts, to look at our fiscal and financial aspects, to develop strategies to serve future travel markets and demand, change travel markets and demand. And um, in support of all of that, the board just recently adopted some guiding principles for this work that will lead us to those needs-based and financial or and fiscally constrained plans. Those principles, I won't read the detail, but they're around mobility and equity, financial of key past and future concern for RTD, workforce partnerships and sustainability. And you can read more details on that slide. So that's an update, or my attempt at least, at an update on Reimagine RTD. And then one other item that we've discussed a little tonight, and that is of some uh, real interest to a number of stakeholders and to the Dr. Cog board, to Chair Stoltzman's um, comments regarding the immediacy of um, fair struck, fair fair and past programs for our current work, we're also embarking on a system-wide fair study and equity analysis. The purpose of that study is to take a comprehensive look at our fair structure and past programs. We recognize uh, that many people see RTD as a very expensive transit option. And in fact, our transit fares are um, among the higher and nationally, and we recognize that. So we want to evaluate fair affordability and structure through this fair study and equity analysis with the idea of increasing access for all to our services. So the study elements that we're gonna be undertaking, fair study and equity analysis. That equity analysis is in um, concert with and uh, will be consistent with and follow the federal regulations um, from FTA to ensure enforcement of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which requires an equity analysis whenever an agency makes major service changes or changes to its fares and fare structure. We intend to have a comprehensive and robust public involvement process with outreach to diverse populations. Again, as I said, with guidance from FTA, Federal Transit Administration, we're gonna really work on considering the impact and cost structure on those who use transit the most, those who are the essential workers and the passengers that rely on RTD even through pandemic and post-pandemic as well. We're kicking off our first round of engagement to inform creation of the scope of work for this study this summer in the June, July timeframe. 
with scope writing to follow immediately thereafter, and then kick off uh, consultant selection and a process where we're looking at the technicalities, the costs, the elasticities of demands, the forecast impact on ridership and on um, protected populations under the Civil Rights Act. It's about an 18 month process from when we kick off next month through late 2022 when we anticipate our board of directors will review the equity analysis and make decisions regarding new fair structure. Director so, Van Leader, we'll pause right there and just take questions on this. I was expecting some hands when you pulled this slide up and I was not disappointed. Director Odoricio, let us know what you'd like to ask. Thank you. I hope I'm not interrupting Bill. Um, I, I do ask when we look at studies and, and, and start, what I'm concerned about is systemic, not, I, I guess what I would say is like, what I wanna make sure is that we don't, when, when looking at things like RTD, ridership, et cetera, that we don't focus on just how do we bolster those who already have ridership, those who already have routes, those who already have um, services in their area. And I think sometimes what I have found that, that it's, it, it, we create cycles and so though that, that a lot of these studies uh, create some innate uh, biases, and I'm talking geographic, uh, potentially also other types of biases in that people who leverage or utilize it, when you base things on utilization, you, it tends to reward those organizations or those geographies that already have service. And so I'm going to, I'm always curious to, to see how we can avoid um, situations where you're creating systemic uh, biases in, in our studies. And, and to be more clear and specific, um, some of these outlying suburbs quite often don't do well in these studies or the outcomes of these studies or how these studies are implemented or applied in decision making because they simply don't have the services. And so you continue to increase the, the gap between the haves and the have nots as far as services goes, which then creates more of a gap uh, in the uh, resources. So I'm gonna always be curious on uh, and, and trying to make sure we're all have a watchful eye on, on these types of things. So I don't know if you have any comments on that, but I'm always a little skeptical when I start to see more studies done and we start talking about, well, we're gonna really dive in to see who's using this stuff. See what I'm saying, Bill? Understood and um, a, a similar dialogue has reached my ears from our board of directors. That wasn't well stated, but our board of directors has, has had a uh, similar discussion and dialogue regarding um, geographic issues. And so noted and it will be reported back as part of the input. I have a feeling some of our input um, is starting tonight, and I'm happy to uh, record and hear some of those thoughts and comments from Dr. Cog Board because it's an important stakeholder for us to be listening to as it relates to all of these issues, including this project. So, geographic. Thank you. Noted. Thank you, Director Van Meter. Director Kelsey? Um, just to follow up with Director Odoricio's comment and take it a little further, um, back when I lived in Minnesota, I was a I rode buses. They have a very very um, good bus system, but we also my family was way out in the suburbs, and so by the, you know the the service way out to the suburbs was not as um, as easy to access as the when as the system when you got downtown um and i always wondered you know why when when they looked at ridership and they said well you know we don't have much ridership way out in the suburbs it's like well because you're not offering as much 
Um, you know, the, it doesn't run as often. It closes down early in the evening, doesn't start up as early in the morning. It's kind of like if you drew a retail analogy, a, a store pulls merchandise, decides to discontinue a product because it didn't sell very well. Well, it was never on the shelf. Um, you can't sell what you don't have out there to, to available for people to buy. So I guess I'm, it seems to me if you, if you make the fares as reasonable as you possibly can and make sure you're not overlooking um, service areas that might really benefit from uh, additional service, you're, you're, although you may not get as much in uh, revenue from a single ticket, if you increase the ridership, um, you, you can still increase your revenues. Um, so that's, it's kind of the dilemma that you're always in. How can we make it more affordable for people so that we have more riders? We're not running empty, empty buses or empty trains. So thank you. Thank you, Director Kelsey and Director Odoricio. Great line, great line of thought and questions there. Director Peck. Thank you. Um, I am actually going to piggyback on the last two comments. I'm wondering about the subcommittee that is going to dive into this stu the study elements. Are we going to, is it going to be a portion of the reimagine that is going to break off and be a, a subcommittee? Or are you going to have a completely different group? Because my concern is, based upon the last two comments, are we going to have anybody on that subcommittee who is in a uh, marginal community, a rural community, who can truly address the equity analysis? Um, if it is only that the people who are in urban areas um, and well-served well areas, then I don't think we need input from the other areas as well. And, somebody on that subcommittee from those areas would be helpful. Thank you. Appreciate that. And we're still in the process of forming that committee, um, but the geographic theme and representation um, from kind of all geographies throughout the Dr. Cog district on a number of different fronts from a fair study perspective, from a service perspective, and from this specific committee is one message is coming through loud and clear to me. And so um, I will get that back to our staff who are forming that committee as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Peck. And that takes us to Director Seitz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have, it's gonna feel like I'm piling on a little bit from the, the three previous directors. Um, Similar to Director Kelsey, I just wanted to talk about um, the fact that this does seem kind of like a pricing strategy issue. And I was wondering if part of this study is going to be analyzing case studies from maybe other transportation districts. And you know, are there some that have seen a, a decrease in fares, have an increase of ridership that maybe offsets that initial um, you know, uh, revenue reduction? So I'm curious if that if part of this will be looking at case studies to see how other agencies handle um, fares. Yes, it will. So um, based on past work, we have what we feel is a pretty good understanding of the response to riders for fare increases because we've had those mm -hmm. um, and, and how that impacts our ridership, what our elasticity of demand is locally. But which is general, which generally in, in past studies, again, past studies pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. um, has paralleled trends in peer cities and nationally. Um, but that information, particularly pandemic and anticipating what it will look like post-pandemic is kind of a key consideration and question that we have. So we will be hiring um, experts who have experience doing similar studies in other cities that are currently working on these sorts of fair studies in other cities so they can bring that expertise on what they're seeing and learning from those studies to bear 
in addition to the findings and experience that we have had um, in the past in response to past fare increases. And again, um, we recognize that our fares are near the high end nationally. And I think there's a lot of motivation to really make sure that we look at the possibility of that kind of virtuous cycle that I think a number of you are talking about, lower fares, more ridership, more, more potential fare box revenue. So we'll look at that. Challenge, challenges that um, generally pre-pandemic, most ridership um, for most systems, including RTD is relatively inelastic. You drop, you raise prices, you don't lose a lot of riders. You lower prices, you don't gain a lot of riders. Um, and, and that's one of the things we wonder, will it change post pandemic? Is that the only consideration that we should be taking in terms of our pricing and our strategy? Should it also be thinking about things like social equity, geographic um, costs and fares and impacts as well? And the intent and direction from our board and it's being reinforced by this discussion tonight is that we need to be making those considerations. I really appreciate that. And that leads into my next question, which was really addressing, you know, understanding barriers to ridership in, um, in this equity analysis. So is it mainly fair? Is it uh, service, right? It doesn't match the types of jobs that folks um, who, who maybe are low income um, or have different needs um, and hours, do we have service that matches the, the employers um, that, they, that they work at? Reliability, you know, are they gonna be able to make it home? And then wayfinding. You know, I think we've learned a lot about the digital divide uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, it is difficult um, trying to teach my 14 year old how to figure out what bus routes are, right? Um, and we have a lot of tech at our fingertips and she's pretty savvy on how to use it. Um, so just hoping that this also includes kind of a barrier analysis of, of in, within the equity study. Um, and then finally, the last thing I was gonna ask is if there will be any consideration of stakeholders that perhaps um, have a, a vested interest in us upping ridership um, and so, that might be employment centers, that might be folks who care about affordable housing, that might, you know, those who care about greenhouse gas emissions. So those were my, I know I kind of pushed those two together, but figured I'd let you answer them in one, in one blow. <laughs> um, we haven't written the scope of work yet. Those are some pretty cool ideas. And so I'm taking note, uh, quite a few notes I've been trying to scribble while also paying attention. Um, and uh, appreciate it. So I don't have a concrete answer, but those are some intriguing ideas and this commentary is good, so. I appreciate your uh, willingness yeah. to entertain my Thank thoughts. you, and Director Meter, as I said before, this is recorded and you'll be able to watch it again later. That is the beauty True. of these meetings. True. Um, you know, I think people brought up a lot of really good points about service equity and whether we're providing service um, I look at that 18 months and I'm a little like, ugh, 18 months. The, if this is very obvious that the price is too high and your pricing structure is too complicated. And so like, what are we, uh, I, I don't exactly understand why we're gonna pay a consultant a million dollars to find that out and take 18 months. Like that seems frustrating to me when we all are sitting here and we know the price is too high and your pricing structure is too complicated. So I just wonder, I mean, is this set in stone? like? It just, this seems like you could go to the FTA, ask to do a pilot study or an evaluation of potential and make a change and try it. I just, 18 months seems totally unacceptable to me, but maybe that's just crazy. So uh, um, I'll, I'll try to uh, give, give you the, the perspective and constraints that we, we have. Um, to, make, to, to make any sort of permanent changes requires this equity analysis we're talking about, and it's for compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. To do that, the Federal Transit Administration requires that you have current, that is within the past five years, survey data on your ridership. So you understand um, who your ridership is 
and what potential impacts the fare changes might have on that ridership. Our last comprehensive survey of our ridership was completed in the 2015 timeframe. So we're outside of that five year window from FTA. Federal Transit Administration has informed us that they would not consider a survey of our current ridership, still mid pandemic, to be valid for the purposes to base an equity analysis on. We anticipate, are hoping that we'll be out of this and returned somewhere near the new normal in terms of ridership by the spring of next year. So one of the steps that we need to do to support the equity analysis to make a permanent change is this understanding of our ridership that's current in order to analyze um, and make sure that we're doing things right under the auspices of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. We, we and I won't, FTA I don't need to won't, understand it. I totally yeah. understand, like, I guess FTA that you have won't a lot of allow us to do that before then. And to a pilot project, that is something that could potentially be done. Um, when we just did one recently on North Metro, we did six months. When we took it away, it was difficult and painful because we're not allowed to go beyond six months without a Title VI equity analysis. Um, it was difficult and painful for stakeholders and for our passengers to accept and understand. So we're a little leery of that at, at a staff level, but it's certainly something that the board and the accountability committee has been discussing and maybe making some recommendations to RTD around. By the way, that this this does complete my presentation, so you don't have to listen to me anymore. Um, I have I have nothing more. So, uh, Billy, you've, you've been great and lived up to every expectation uh, at the onset when I promised everyone a good presentation that we were excited to see once a year presentation from you. So thank you a million for giving us all this information and for giving us the opportunity to weigh in. You can see how engaged the group was on this topic and how much we all really do care about transit and RTD and the services you provide for our community members. And so just wanna extend the thanks of the entire board for everything that you're doing. And we do, even though we give you guys a hard time and try to hold you accountable and be the best you can be, we do really value what you do for our communities. And thank you for that. Any other questions or comments on this topic before we move on? All right, not seeing any. That takes us to our committee reports this evening. Um, and so uh, we'll just have brief committee reports from folks if they were there. And if they were not, they'll just tell us there's no report. So the first is from the State Transportation Advisory Committee and I'll turn it to Director Maurer. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the May stack meeting, there were no action items, but stack did receive several informational briefings about the current status of greenhouse gas rulemaking an update on the Central 70 project, CDOT's 2045 statewide plan process, lessons learned, and CDOT's historic bridge program. The greenhouse gas rulemaking item include discussions on CDOT, on how CDOT is addressing stakeholder comments received to date, as well as a timeline of when the rulemaking will apply to Dr. Cog's next regional transportation plan and other MPO and transportation planning region plans across the state. And I conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you, Director Maurer, Metro Mayor's Caucus. Director Starker. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The Metro Mayor's Caucus met on in full caucus on May 6th. We had an update on the Build for Zero uh, pr program to uh, end veterans homelessness in our uh, area of the world. We had a discussion on, on the Senate Bill 260, the state transportation bill that we've discussed tonight. Uh, CML, Kevin Bomber and Megan Dollar uh, joined us to talk about uh, updates that they were following in the, um, in the legislature, including SB 256, a firearms proposal, SB 62, the jail population management tools bill, and uh, HB 1117, affordable housing. And we finished our meeting with a COVID-19 update with uh, Bob McDonald from Denver Public Health. With that, I will conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you, Director Starker. Uh, report from the Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we did meet in April. We had a meeting about uh, transportation, I'm sorry, about homelessness. And we were joined by um, uh, several members of the federal government, and we were 
able to talk to them a little bit about all of their um, different um, uh, funding mechanisms for addressing the homelessness. In our um, uh, May meeting, we talked about um, uh, the transportation package, uh, Senate Bill 260, and we were joined also by Michael Davies, the government relations officer for RTD. So uh, I will just say that the, the MAC group, Metro Area County Commissioners, has been re-energized and reinvigorated under the leadership of um, Adams County Commissioner Eva Henry, and I encourage all county commissioners to attend that meeting. You'll be surprised at the changes taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is a report from our Advisory Committee on Aging, Director Jayla Sanchez Warren. And Jayla, I muted you. I was trying to get rid of that background noise, so you're probably muted now. And no, I, I, I got unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Rich gave us a, a legislative update on all the aging bills that are going on out there. Uh, we learned from uh, our members how each county was doing vaccines for homebound folks, which was really interesting. Um, and then we and the committee voted to uh, establish a task force to uh, deal with the impact that the hospital transformation program, which I told you about last last month, is having on community-based service providers as well as AAA. So we're going to have a task force that includes uh, hospitals and uh, uh, governments and uh, folks from the governor's office and then uh, community service providers to just uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. Thank That's you. My so report. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, next up, we have a report from the Regional Air Quality Council from our Executive Director, Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Regional Air Quality Council met on, on Friday, May 7th. We got a number of briefings. The first was a, a briefing on the upcoming strategy of their public awareness campaign, Simple Steps, Better Air. Um, we received two presentations from CDOT. One was on the State Transportation Funding Bill, Senate Bill 260, as well as um, the um, uh, proposed greenhouse uh, gas rule rulemaking that's upcoming. Um, we received an update from CDOT staff on that as well. And they uh, and RAC finalized their strategic plan is something that they've been working on for the past couple of years. And it does kind of mirror the uh, balanced scorecard approach that we've taken here at Dr. Cog. Um, actually, our very own Jerry Stiegel recently retired. Uh, we lent him out to RAC on uh, periodically through through the last two years to help with that. So um, we're, we were very pleased to see that they finished. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Director uh, John Dyack, would you like to tell us about E-470? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, E-470, we, uh, we met on May 13th. Our meeting consisted of a presentation of the KPMG 2020 financial audit. Happy to report it was a clean audit. We also had a discussion on a series 2021 bond resolution. Um, there would be a need to uh, refinance or reissue bonds due to a discontinuation of, of the LIBOR index. With that, we'll be saving about $700,000. So that's a good thing. Uh, we also had additional um, report outs and uh, dashboard uh, briefings, if you will, uh, on all of our metrics from a financial and operations standpoint. We also, um, considered and approved a um, WSP uh, vendor extension. Uh, WSP is our vendor for the call center. So we are approving uh, and extending their contract. Madam Chair, that is all I have. Thank you. And next we have a report from CDOT from Director Rebecca White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just a, a few items to note tonight. Uh, the Central 70 project, uh, replacement of the, the viaduct there by the um, uh, right there in Glovell, Larry Swansea is hitting a huge milestone this weekend. If you happen, haven't happened to see this in the media, it's called the Mile High Shift. We are officially moving traffic off the 54-year-old uh, viaduct and down into the first part of the lowered section. Uh, to make that happen, the interstate will be fully closed along that section this weekend. And hopefully, uh, should you drive this corridor next week, you will be in for a much different experience. Uh, so we're very glad to, uh, to be at that milestone with that project. 
And that allows uh, several months of work to begin to take down the viaduct in a very uh, surgical way because there's a lot of new infrastructure um, right underneath it. Um, other than that, uh, revitalizing Main Street, if you recall, we received 30 million uh, in funding from the state legislature. These were stimulus dollars to support this program. We've divided that into two separate grant programs, uh, larger grants focused on safety. That, uh, those grants, we asked for applications by May 14th, so that closed last Friday. I'm, I'm, I think I'm happy to say we got 70 applications. Uh, so we will be uh, hard at work uh, going through those over the next month or so. I think it's a real demonstration of the need around the state to be looking at how we can improve the safety of our, our main streets. Uh, and then the, the other part of that program, the sort of roughly 8 million uh, is on a rolling basis. So I still encourage you all to, to be working with your communities. If you still have ideas out there for smaller projects, can really help everyone get through these uh, last this last stretch of COVID and keep uh, downtowns vibrant and keep people kind of moving around outside. That's really the focus of that, uh, that smaller grant program. Last thing I'll note, uh, like you all, we've been very focused on Senate Bill 260. Very excited to be at this point in the legislative process um, after many, many years of trying. So uh, that has been a, a uh, dominant focus at the department over the recent months. That's it for me tonight, Chair. Thank you, Director White. And we had an excellent report already today from Director Bill Pemeter. So we will move on to just let you all know there are some great informational items when you have time to read in your packet. Please do that. And that takes us to our administrative items. Um, our next meeting is June 16th, 2021. And I'll ask if there are any other matters by members this evening. All right, not seeing any. Thank you everyone very much and we're adjourned. Good night. Good night. And everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night.